So um, hello, everybody. I'm very happy to speak in uh, front of so many fascinating scientists here from this wonderful community. So thank you very much for this conference. Um, I would have loved to meet you all in person, but I guess that's for another day. So I'm uh, Yannick Becker, and I'm finishing my PhD in Marseille with Adrien Micadition and Olivier Coulon. And it's the first time I speak about the Arcade Vesiculus. Um, I hope it will be fluid. I tried to make this presentation not too technical and easily understandable. Uh, because as you will see, it is a kind of nerdy adventure where most functional theories about language evolution are based on structural anatomy. So to understand these theories, you need to understand the studies and methods about brain anatomy. And you can read our late, you can read also later our preprint uh, online, which is talk is based. Um, thanks to the uh, comments of the reviewers, we will improve this. So if you um, want to wait for the last version, uh, I hope it will come out soon and um so anyways because you're probably interested in language evolution and when you come about uh, the language evolution of the, in the brain you will forcibly come across the arcade fasciculus and i would have loved to receive this kind of uh, presentation when i entered the subject as a student before um so before entering this conceptual talk, I will give a very little teaser about my PhD results so that you know where I come from and why I'm interested uh, in this conference and the ARCID. Um, so language is structurally and functionally organized on the left side of the brain for most functions and most individuals. At the heart of this network are two key regions, um, the palm temporale and Broca's area, and both are linked by a white matter fiber bundle, the ARCID fasciculus or AF. I will say a lot AF in this talk. It will be always the arcade fasciculus. Um, and the question is whether there's a continuity in non-human primates concerning this brain anatomy. So uh, we know from chimpanzee at the population level that homologous language structures are also left letterized. And uh, researchers propose that the premises precursors of this organization are linked to gestural communication on human primates. And my work uh, consists in one, investigating the potential lateralizations of these key structures in monkeys, because this has never been done. And second, investigating um, the potential links between the communicative gesture of non-human primates and the neuroanatomical organization homologous to that of language in humans. Mm. So our first key region uh, was Broca's homolog, which is buried in this uh, ventral part of, of uh, the sulcus here. And we have a technique to uh, represent the sulcus in 3D and then do measurements of it. And uh, this way, we found something very interesting in regards to communication. So here you see a juvenile baboon trying to intimidate me with the hand slap. And he's using the right hand for communication. And for those subjects that are using right hand for communication, the, the last part, um, the, the, the left uh, part of this sarcus uh, is actually uh, deeper than the right part of the sarcus. And those that are communicating with that left hand have this uh, part of the sarcus deeper in the right hemisphere. And especially uh, at this ventral part where Baroque's homolog is supposed to be. Um, and there's a second key structure, the plum temporale, uh, which is the plane uh, on the posterior end of the sylvian fissure. You can see it um, here in this baby baboon brain in 3D. Um, and it is known that the plum temporale is bigger on the left than uh, right hemisphere in human babies. And therefore, this planum uh, asymmetry is seen as a structural mark of the human baby's innate resident readiness to acquire language. And we have tested whether newborn baboons possess also this asymmetry. And actually, we're quite uh, amazed to see that they do. So we measured the surface and the volume of this area and found it um, to be large on the left hemisphere. And therefore, we questioned this asymmetry to be a mark of the human baby's innate readiness to acquire language. Um, we propose that it may rather underlie a commonly shared cognitive function between humans and monkeys. Um, <clears throat> which is shared between humans and monkeys, which is still at the heart of language evolution and, uh, and, and language in general and humans nowadays. And we wanted to know if this commonly shared function may be related to gestural communication and waited for the subjects to develop their gestural repertoire. And uh, so the first data is coming out now, and we're very happy to see that the subjects that had the planum temporally large on the left hemisphere are actually more likely to become right-handed 
um, for communication. So um, you see now why I became naturally interested in the arcade fasciculus because um, in humans, it connects these two key uh, areas. And does this, uh, is it the same in monkeys? And it was then that I discovered a total chaos in the literature where one version of the monkey AF was not like another version. So there were as many anatomical interpretations as papers, and unfortunately, most theories about language evolution uh, serves upon those anatomical descriptions. So in fact, there were different techniques and different names that brought towards different anatomical interpretation. And I, so I think the changes in, in methods are crucial here, and I just want to present some examples for you to understand this. So the first a method um, a technique to identify the arcuate fasciculus were post-mortem dissections of the human brain in the 19th century. And this technique uh, includes in particular blunt dissection with the surgeon separates tissue layers by means of an instrument without a cutting edge. Um, so first identified by Reil, the named arcuate fasciculus by Bordach in 80, 20, 20. Um, arcuate actually means, um, or was named at that point Bogenbündel. Uh, Bogen means arch in German, for those that speak uh, German in Düsseldorf. And it was then Karl Wernicke who uh, suddenly named it superior longitudinal fasciculus or SLF. And from that time on, the two names are used as synonyms in the literature. Um, and this can be problematic because as we know now, um, I propose this simplified definition for now is that the SLF is linking frontal with parietal regions and the AF is linking frontal with temporal regions and is doing this prominent arc, arch, uh, which the SLF is not. Um, the second technique which advanced our understanding of brain connections was track tracing, um, like the section, this is ex vivo, and you have to understand that the fiber or axon connects via synapse uh, to a second axon. So axon, synapse, axon, and only track tracing methods can unveil the monosynaptic uh, connections between cortical areas. So um, this technique consists in injecting a tracer and then um, uh, such as radiating amino acids, and then it will stain uh, the fibers and the termination sites. So for example, here they injected this site and they saw stain over here. And the latest technique studying structural brain connectivity is diffusion MRI, uh, which is a beautiful technique because it's in vivo actually. And uh, this technique tracks diffusion movements of water molecules. So water molecules are constrained by the narrow axon membranes. So this way you can see um, the brain connections uh, indirectly, um, thanks to this technique. And um, the problem is that in this technique, you can't know whether a connection is monosynaptical or not. So back um, 15 years ago, there's a still prominent model which arised uh, where the arcuate fasciculus was divided into three uh, different segments, where the um, red long direct segment is what we would call arcuate now and the green anterior and indirect segment um, is more connecting posterior to frontal areas and would be called slf now would we'll go into details for the um, third one but all those together were named uh, dorsal pathway also because it's quite difficult to, to divide in diffusion mri the different tracts so they were called dorsal pathway in contrast to a ventral pathway, which is connecting the same areas, kind of the same areas, um, but arching dorsally around the sylvian fissure and the ventral pathway is arching uh, ventrally around the sylvian fissure. So I'll be very naive here and just put up two illustrations that we we'll probably find in literature if you're not an expert of this field and two illustrations, one for the human AF and one for the monkey AF and we can play um, spot the differences now. Because you see, there are differences. Um, the first is that uh, the frontal terminations for the human AF are very inferior here in the fear frontal cortex, while the monkey, it's more up here in the, the dorsal part of the frontal cortex. Then the temporal connection uh, are very different as well. So they are in the middle part of the, the temporal lobe in humans and just at the temporal parietal junction monkeys. Um, and then a bit harder to see, there's actually um, something going on about the proportion of the strength 
of the ventral pathway in regards to the dorsal pathway, which is quite weak in humans and is actually stronger than even the, the dorsal pathway in monkeys. And for the sake of the time, I just pick two examples, um, one treating the uh, frontal terminations and one doing this example of the ventral against dorsal pathway proportion. Um, so in humans, the AF is terminating the Broca's area, including area 44 in the pus ocularis and area 45 in the pus triangularis. And these frontal regions are significant for language because they're involved in the high level control of our facial motor responses that are needed for language production. So direct AF connections to these frontal regions provide access to key motor actions um, that we need to express language like articulation, facial expression, and gesture. Um, and in monkeys, there are these results that show that there are no terminations in Tabroca homolog. But then if you dig deeper, you actually find illustrations about terminations in Tabroca homolog. And I will explain now where this comes from and what this has as uh, theoretical implications. So first, a monkey's terminations outside Broca's homolog. Um, in fact, in the original track tracing experiments, uh, Petridis and Pandya uh, localize the frontal terminations. So not here in Broca's homolog, but over here in area posterior part of um, dorsal part 8, 46, and 6. And uh, this was reproduced and influentially put inside this atlas, which is still much used now. And this elicited theories about the role of the AF and monkeys, which might not, um, which might thus coordinating very low level processes like um, sound localization of this area with the involvement of head and eye movements of these areas. So such low level processes in monkeys were seen as evolutionary gaps with the high level language functions to the human AF. In other words, the AF was actually questioned of playing a crucial role in language processing. And Abautis and Garcia proposed therefore that the parietal lobe um, might have played a fundamental element in language evolution because it linked indirectly the two key structures. So this structure is directly linked with this one, the parietal lobe, and the parietal lobe is also linked with this structure. So if you want to go from here to here, you have to pass through the parietal lobe. Um, in their view, it permitted the development of an interface between the auditory processing device and a working memory circuit uh, for complex vocalization um, that includes these areas. But there are also more contemporary uh, functional theories that are influenced by, by these results, and I can't go into details here now. So what happened then that in other illustrations, um, the AF is terminating into Broca's homolog? And this is really due to a tiny change in methods and a change in knowledge, because during the first studies in the 80s, there was no cytoarchitectural equivalence that was known for homologous Broca's area in the monkey brain. So the authors explained that no terminations to Broca's homolog, which would be here, um, were found because the initial injection sites here were not placed ventrally enough. Um, this changed when they found Broca's homolog, and, and now actually they, they saw the track from here to here and from here to here, and they found three different branches uh, connecting one area 45, 44, and area 6 and 8. So in, in some, the frontal terminations of the AF are highly conserved between humans and macaques. And if they are, the question arises why language has evolved in humans alone then. And this is kind of an open question and um, it goes out to uh, We propose some possibilities, but I would hear your accounts later. Um, so I would say that it might not be the location of the connection, but the increase of strength of these connections that enables language evolution or uh, there might be an increased voluntary laryngeal control in the human area 44, but not in the macaque, or perhaps the frontal termination of the AF are just not the anatomical core of language processing. Okay, so second example, the uh, proportion strength of the dorsal versus ventral pathway. Um, sorry. Um, so as I said, the human AF is making up with the uh, SLF, the dorsal language pathway, opposition to this ventral pathway. And um, so most times you will find they account for a stronger ventral pathway than dorsal pathway in monkeys. And sometimes not. And this again has a lot of implications. So uh, first, where does the stronger ventral than dorsal account comes from? In fact, in their pioneering work, uh, Rilling and colleagues in 2008 and 12 um, compared the dorsal and ventral pathway across primate species using diffusion MRI 
And um, they found a macaque a dorsal pathway that connects um, just a little bit area 44 here. And it's quite weak and connects um, the only temporal area here, which is in the temporal parietal junction. Um, but there was a strong ventral pathway that connects all the temporal areas and also brocosomal node, which was the complete opposite in humans, where the dorsal pathway is very strong and connects all these areas. So uh, they concluded that the dorsal um, arcuate fasciculus pathway was more significantly modified than the ventral pathway in human evolution. And therefore, the great extent of temporal lobe information, like auditory information, would be exclusively conveyed by the ventral uh, pathway. And also, uh, it may be um, the transfer of lexical semantic information and some element of syntax, which was due to the dorsal pathway in humans alone. And this finding, um, oh, sorry, and in, in monkeys, actually, uh, as in the example before, um, was more related to low level processes uh, like um, the spatial localization of sounds. So this finding and interpretation had a conceptual impact of, on several theories trying to retrace the evolution of language. And um, one comes from uh, Friedrichsi's latest uh, book, um, where she proposes that because the dorsal stream conveys complex syntax in the human brain um, due to the area 44 connections, um, and the ventral stream conveys simple syntax and semantics in the human brain uh, due to area 45 connections. Um, and because monkeys don't have any or very few um, dorsal connections to area 44, monkeys have no complex syntax. Um, but monkeys have the ventral connections to 44 and 45, so they have some simple syntax and, and semantics. And um, this got supported by behavioral data from the same group, where they showed that, um, so behavioral and uh, brain data in, in infants, where it showed that infants don't have um, like the most major grammar complex syntax until the age of seven. And it's just until the age of seven that the arcuate fasciculus is not uh, reaching Broca's area. Um, and However, there's some ideas contrasting the theory that, for example, due to this data, Jessica Dubois' lab in Paris says that the connections are actually there, um, but you just can't see them due to the image or microstructure um, of this connection. And, and this is why you can't see them in photography. And also there are some recent behavioral studies showing that monkeys can actually break through the syntax barrier, as Takem C. Fitch would put it, um, but they came out after, after her book. And then there are very recent studies contrasting this idea of a greater ventral than dorsal strength in monkeys. This is very interesting. So in a diffusion MRI study across primate species, uh, there was again a change in methods because the authors were able to functionally find the auditory cortex and took this as a seed for photography. So Bazo and colleagues highlight a dorsal pathway connection into the auditory cortex, which was until then reserved to the ventral pathway. So um, the authors suggested that the arcuate dorsal pathway is important for sound and vocal patterning in the time domain, not just for very low level processes as um, uh, well, proposed before. And further on a functional basis, using effective connectivity by stimulating the auditory cortex, uh, Rochi and colleagues showed that dorsal and, uh, so ventral and dorsal pathways connect to the same degree brokers homolog and monkeys. Um, so even if diffusion MRI showed that structurally the ventral pathway seems stronger than dorsal monkeys functionally, that seems not to be the case. And these authors propose, therefore, that uh, language abilities allowing humans to name, conceptualize, and better remembering sounds would be actually shared across uh, neonimal primates. Uh, so I just put up here two recent illustrations of the AF to conclude to show you how much they can be fair in the literature. Um, and even though they're quite near, um, so just some years I set them apart. And that when you read a theory about language brain evolution, you must extremely pay attention on which premises and anatomy, the space and, and on which method. Uh, so in conclusion, um, I would say that, the, it, that there is evidence for continuity of um, frontal terminations across primates. There's also evidence for continuity in the YAF's proportional strength um, in regards to the ventral pathway. I haven't talked about the temporal terminations uh, nor about the lateralization, 
but same kind of same story. So uh, I would like to conclude uh, with the words of, of, of Darwin um, that I think it's not um, a question really of kind here again, but a question of degree and that uh, language and the AF may have co-evolved progressively in primate evolution. I would like to say thank you to uh, the members of the team that helped in this um, in, in, in this work and also thank the funders and we're very happy to take questions now to Sudov. Thank you.